so the stage is yours perfect all right so wonderful to be here in this virtual setting um i'm looking forward to speak to all of turkey today well which is actually quite excited i'm i'm unfortunately not there i'm in the cold northern germany in hamburg um but i wish i was down south a bit more so this talk is about basically a couple of things which i will illustrate in a second but before we do that i want to actually tell you a little bit about myself not because i'm immensely proud about who i am and what i have accomplished and it's more like a history of why it matters these days right because i've been through the it industry for a long long time have always worked in rather international roles and i have worked for a lot of companies who were at the leading edge of their respective technologies so just to give you an idea so i started in a consultancy company so we did business consulting they may not be well known outside of say central europe but they were basically advising large companies very early on in the let's say late 90s early 2000s around how to do digital transformation to be fair back in the days it wasn't called digital transformation of course but it was some similar concept like how do we take something paper based and move it into an electronic process back in the days like how can we in other words make computers help us so i moved on to a large company which i'm sure some of you may know some of you may not know which is unisys which used to be one of the biggest it companies in the world in the late 80s and then they made some i don't know rather strange decisions maybe and they were moving more towards being an industry specific solution provider but i had the opportunity to work in a lot of the outsourcing business back in the days like how do i take a service that a company had like email servers right file servers print services desktop services support services application support etc and move it from an in-house it to an outsourced provider right Then I moved on to found my own startup because I thought I was the smartest person to do so. I wasn't and it flopped, but it gave me some great idea about how technology actually drives business. And that got me to VMware, um which obviously is a well-known and well-respected company and VMware was experimenting not just with virtualization back in the early days but also it sort of invented the underlying foundation for what we now know is cloud computing or more specifically infrastructure as a service that said i moved on to another interesting topic of technology which was big data right the whole element of big data like how is data analyzed how is it done at scale how is it distributed how is it um used in a business context right how can people get more inside out of it and most importantly how do i plan for a data driven future and because mappa eventually got acquired by a company like hbe i decided to join a different startup which is called scale ai now one of silicon valley's darlings around data preparation data labeling data quality measurements etc cetera, etc cetera. and ultimately i didn't like it too much there so i joined hbe not just because they made me a great offer but because what they told me they wanted to do really really struck my interest but as you can tell so i worked in a lot of different fields so i bring a lot of experience in the different fields like i worked in cloud in ai ml leading edge technology industry solutions outsourcing service provider and i'm not saying that i'm an expert in all of them at all but it gives you a very distinctive perspective on all these different areas and how nowadays everything comes together and this is exactly what i was intending to do today i want to give you all a little bit of a history lesson then let's look at what's currently happening in our clients and in all our industry and last but not least take a leap and look at what the future is going to bring don't worry this is not going to be a vendor pitch per se i'll touch on some of our offerings of course because well you got to do it but the more important thing is that this is my personal lessons learned broken down in easy terms because 
Whenever my colleagues, um, people on my team, our customers ask me, hey, how do you see the world right now? I give them a very similar presentation. So, and I hope you will appreciate that because in my opinion, it's valuable content because it is something that I got not from analysts, but from feedback, from talking to customers, to clients, to many people like you at conferences when it was still possible. And I think it kind of reflects very accurately what is currently happening in fact. So that said, let's get started. So the first thing is that I see is that right now, and this might not be used to you, I'm pretty sure everybody in the room knows this, is a company these days or an organization or a public service institution, or even a data scientist, a data analyst in front of his or her laptop, they are faced with two extremes. One is technology is moving faster and faster than ever before, right? You all know this, right? There's new technologies coming up every year or so. There's new open source tooling, there's new data science management tools, etc., new frameworks, whatever. And they all come up like every week almost. And those are driven by major technology trends. And let's look about them real quick. Obviously, it's cloud computing as one, right? Everything is cloud somehow, hybrid, public, private, whatever. But people talk about cloud a lot still. Mobile, right? 5G, the mobile revolution, edge devices and whatnot, right? We live in the mobile area that clearly did not even exist 15 years ago. I was actually reminded by the fact that the iPhone was only launched in 2007 recently. And if you imagine that being sort of the kickoff, if you will, of modern day mobile devices, um, that wasn't even 15 years ago, if you think about it. And a lot has changed in those uh, 14, not even 15 years. Then, obviously, we talk about more and more things are being connected to the internet, more and more things doing more things um, to um, help our clients, customers, etc., get a better spin on their business, to measure it in real time. And more and more devices are sending data to, in fact, the internet for us to be analyzed for many different reasons. And then it is MLAI, right? Machine learning, artificial intelligence, what used to be more or less an analytical joke only 10 years ago has become mainstream requirements for all companies, all digitalization um, initiatives. And obviously it is driving a whole industry. And if you take this event as an example, it is a perfect, perfect um, summary of how important AI has become in the recent few years. Having said that, that is all the strategic side, but there's a tactical element as well, because those are technology trends, but it's not where people spend money because you can't spend money on trends because you need to still invest in something that's more tangible, that you can touch, that you can feel, that you need. And how do I balance that when we look at where companies are spending money? So my first question, whenever I get to a meeting with say a high level, um, high ranking decision maker is, hey, where are you spending your money? And what is interesting is that across Europe, across the board, across the world, the answers seem to be very much the same everywhere. And people tell me, well, we want we spend money on data driven applications or some new digital service, right? It's almost synonymous if you think about it. So everything has to be somehow data driven these days. Yeah, you can't be without it. People are spending money on containerization. Wow, what a word. Yeah, technology evolves and everybody talks about, yes, we need a containerization product. We need to spend our money on making sure that we catch the latest trend in infrastructure technology and be a part of it. As well as real time and streaming, right? A report needs to be there like this. A report needs to just happen. You don't need to wait for it anymore to show up. Everybody needs the real time access to all data, preferably in the easiest possible way. And last but not least, we want to do it and still save cost. So we have all these trends coming together. We want to build all these amazing new things, but ideally we spend less for it. And this is where it becomes a challenge because how do you do that? You normally don't take something, yeah, spend less and make it better, faster, easier. But there is one thing that has changed. And that is that people over the last years 
have not been able to bring the strategic and the tactical areas together and are only now realizing that the one element that connects it all is the element of data. So if you will, the glue, right? The one thing that brings it all together is data. Devices create data, we need to store it, we need to analyze it, we need to process it, we need to derive data or different data from it. And the whole cycle starts again and again and again and again. With that, however, let me tell you a little bit of the challenges that the organizations are facing to balance the strategy, the tactical elements, and making data essential to their core business. And I will do it by basically plotting you a chart. So this chart looks very simple. So on the bottom, you can see the lock-in specialization. And on the upper hand, if you will, you can see flexibility and agility. So it goes from being very much locked in and special to being open and flexible. Now, if you move from lock-in to specialization, your abstraction level increases. And if we take that concept and apply it to the history of IT, let's start in the 70s, where we had integrated systems. Some of you may or may not know this still, but there used to be things like mainframes, mini computers, highly integrated, highly complex systems who were all but open because they were in fact very proprietary. And whilst they were super specialized, you were basically locked in to that particular architecture. And people are still locked in by these systems today, if you think about it. The mainframe still plays a crucial role in many companies' businesses these days. Now, moving on, we move to into a world of the first standards, which most people say x86, the traditional servers, Windows, processor architectures, right? Some open protocols like NFS, networking, TCP IP and whatnot. And whilst we gained a lot towards agility and flexibility, we also abstracted away from proprietariness. Then virtual machines showed up, yeah? And they gave us even more flexibility and they gave us the concept of the hypervisor, basically decoupling software from hardware for the first time. So what used to be together, yeah, for the first time, it was break broken up. And more has happened since then. In the 2010 plus years, everybody talked about open protocols and data center virtualization, like physical switches became virtual switches, physical firewalls became virtual firewalls, physical something devices became, had virtual equivalents. And all of a sudden, this made possible cloud computing as we know it today. Having said that, however, moving into the more recent years, where containers sort of came up, we talk a lot about resource management. Yeah, everything is a resource nowadays. How much storage do I need? Let's say a few terabytes and everything is a resource. You don't talk about, I'm buying this, I'm buying exactly that component anymore. Everybody just wants resources, compute resources, storage resources, infrastructure resources, and so on and so forth. And preferably in an open source type fashion, right? So that is the whole evolution, simplified of course, of the IT history. Now we are moving into the data age, yeah? Where we talk about and think about how data can be, should be, and will be orchestrated going forward to ultimately have AI ML being the driver. Now, contrary to what you would think is happening now that we increase abstraction, whilst at the same time gain flexibility, we are doing the exact opposite in the industry. And that is by the way, one of the key learnings that I've learned over the last um, few years in fact, is that people tend to think, oh, this is becoming more complex. So let's look at marketing material, yeah? Let's believe all the great startups, all the companies with a lot of money who are fairly innovative out there, and let's go back to the beginning. Because most of the cloud stacks available today, right, 
are in fact getting you back into the early 70s, if you think about it. And if you ask a mainframe customer today, what is the one system you want to get rid of? They will tell you it's the mainframe. But instead of learning from it, yeah, we tend to repeat history and move back to very proprietary, highly integrated stacks that are not physical boxes anymore that you put on your premises or in your data center, but they are some of those software as a service cloud businesses where all you get access to is what they want you to get access to. And this to me, is one of the things that people need to think about these days. Whilst it's easy to get started, surely, and it's a great user experience, it may not be exactly what you would want as an organization because reality shows that it gets even more complex managing all these different elements all together. And don't take any logo here as a, in a bad way, but basically the complexity only increases if you bundle those software as a service things with something you have on premise, with something you may want to do differently tomorrow, or you want to just add a new data source somewhere. And this whole mesh of complexity makes it super hard, right? Super difficult, right, to even scale. Now, how do I tackle that challenge? Well, turns out many people have in fact found solution to get around going back to the past whilst at the same time embracing new technologies. And I have been lucky enough to work with a couple of customers. And let's be honest, let's start with the basics. Some companies say we can all do this ourselves, right? And they will build it themselves. Like they'll take components that they need, yeah, stitch them together, use them in some shape or form and build their very own solution specific to their use case. Now, other companies say, well, I'm not really capable of doing that. I'll pick a systems integrator to do it for me. And whilst they will still do more or less the exact same thing, but they manage us at one thing towards you. And they're responsible is basically to giving you a solution to your respective problem. Now, the third one is you can still go for platforms, of course. You can still go to people and say, hey, give me that end-to-end -end stack. I don't want to know what's running in it. I see it as a black box, or in this case, red box. Yeah. And I just want it to do what I want to do. Provides no flexibility, but it reduces complexity a lot if you think about it. What we, however, believe is, why don't you take an approach that is the best of both worlds? Why don't you look at a portfolio solution? Look at a company where you get the basic elements of what everybody needs, which is a container runtime engine, a data fabric, making sure that data is available, university accessible and secure, some machine learning capabilities, but effectively being able to stitch your own modules, your own little services, left, right, center on top. And then we offer it to you as a managed service, which is basically what we are all about these days and what attracted me a lot to come to HPE because neither am I a big fan of the integrated end-to-end -end stacks because they don't really provide a lot of flexibility. What if you have a great idea in a month from now? You can't wait for these people to change their entire platform. You want to agile, move it in, build it yourself. You may have a lot of challenges with dependencies and let's be honest, systems integrators charge for pretty much every change. So why don't you take the best of both worlds and look at it from a portfolio solution perspective, which by the way, is not necessarily a technology thing, but in my opinion, a key learning. Now, to speed things up a little bit and to give you something else is we ranked our customers in four different categories, like companies who are resisting to change, companies who are experimenting with it, some companies who have already done their initial stages and are scaling their AI ML type workloads and companies who are leading the pack. And let's focus on the two ones leading the pack and see what defines those organizations. And I think it's always important if you speak to your management, if you sit in front of your computer, you go to work every day, is to realize if I want to change my company with data, what requirements do I need to have in place? And I think we have pretty much due to interviews and uh, agencies that we contracted figured out how those data leaders like companies leading the pack actually look like. And 
It turns out they have a large amount of data, so that's not really surprising because that's true for a lot of legacy organizations who are large. But what is interesting is that they have a belief, a fundamental belief, that data is central to their business and they prove it by investing. Yeah, They prove it by hiring people like you. They proving by attending these conferences. They prove it every day by effectively open sourcing stuff or giving something back to the community. Right? They prove it by generating new products based upon data. And at the end of the day, they think data first. Now, they also have high performance requirements, like think of autonomous driving, which I'm like super excited about personally, right? Where you cannot just wait for a decision to happen as you need to do it in real time. This may be oil wells, this may be anything IoT related, where you have to act fast on the data you are collecting at the same time. And they are open to support you, but they don't necessarily want to do it all themselves. They have realized that managing it themselves is too much of a challenge, the more complex a product or a project gets. And last but not least, they have a history of failing with data-driven uh, initiatives. Like they have tried this, they have tried that, they've used cloud, they've got rid of it, they've used mainframes, etc. And ultimately have now figured out that they need to rethink everything else. So that's what a data leader looks like. Now, Let's look at what a scaler looks like, where, in my opinion, most of the organizations are in today. So they are typically growing strongly as a company. I would say in 80% of the cases, they are considered medium-sized companies, although that is a definition that changes a lot between geographies. Yeah, like in the US, a medium-sized company is probably still turning over 12 billion, which I think in our world would be a very large company already. So that is to be determined, but they have realized that data is crucial, but they're just not sure how to do it, right? How to, what to do with it. Like they're collecting it maybe, they're storing it somewhere, but they don't really know what it is and what people do with it in the first place. Um, and they have those requirements for data management in general, but they haven't gone the journey of scaling those particular aspects yet, whilst at the same time, they are also open to realizing that we haven't done this ourselves yet. Yeah, We don't want to do this ourselves. We need someone who can help us on the journey, who can hold our hand and get us to the next level, the next element, if you will, of what's going to happen in our organization. And they have reduced organizational complexity already, which seems to be, by the way, the number one step that typically happens when it comes to uh, embracing new technologies, as we're talking about. So, quick summary, um, and also to be on time, I want to give you guys a big advice. And I hate to say it, because look, I love technology, I worked in technology, I still do but do not let technology features and marketing confuse you because there's people who are getting paid to sell to you, right? There's people who are getting paid to tell you that what you need is the latest and greatest on the market from the most innovative places. But trust me, you should absolutely not believe anything really that comes to you from a marketing or from a salesperson. And that says me being a sales leader, yeah? Don't believe anything that a salesperson or a marketing person tells you, but to achieve the biggest outcome for you, the best outcome for your respective company and for you personally, focus on what you want to do. Don't let people confuse you. Yeah, If you have a plan, if you know where you want to take this project, if you know what you want to do to your company, to yourself, to the industry, right? then focus on that. Don't focus on selecting vendors too much. Don't focus on listening to marketing presentations and webinars all day long. Focus on what you want to achieve. And I can tell you, in my opinion, the most successful organizations they were spiraling, right, for years in selecting the right vendors for their use cases, and they could never find the one vendor, never. 
nobody was ever able. Some people said, yeah, cloud is the way to go. And then they realized, yeah, but cloud can't really do it all. Yeah, it does some of it, but not all of it. Yeah, and people have now started to bring in all these different sets, elements, hardware providers, cloud providers, etc., and are basically looking at a company to manage it for them. But in a way, it stays open, it remains open, and will help you achieve your goals without dictating them, which is the most important thing. And with that, um, I have nothing else to say but thank you. And have a look at the HPE, Esmeral, and GreenLake portfolio if you have more questions.